Hello, it's Cross Questions again. And on our panel tonight, Bilbo Buerta, founder of the Causative Living Foundation and a self-styled neo-Christian. Father Arnold Hurst of St. George's Parktown, the Reverend Bernard Wright of St. Stephen's Krugersdorp, and Father Bonaventure Hinwood of the St. John Vianney Seminary in Pretoria. Our subject tonight is, is the church still relevant? Well, there are some people who say that the church, the institutional church especially, is merely a cumbersome accident which crushes true religion rather than nourishes it. Others again think that the church is an institution whose work is now finished. In fact, it's just an interesting fossil. And others again say that a new spirituality is dawning, a new age, and if the church wants to live again, she must open her doors to it. Bill Berta. I would say the church is very definitely irrelevant. And uh, it has been for a long time and will be for a long time. But the word relevant is a variable, and it is uh, proportional to what? We would say that it is 100% relevant to a small percentage of people, and there is a large percentage of people to which it is not relevant. That is a very important thing to understand. But I would like to say at this stage that uh, the church has done an enormous amount of good, fantastic amount for these last few hundreds of years, and uh, has looked after people, protected them, educated them, been medicine to them, and generally kept them on straight and narrow. And I'd like to say that uh, apart from that, though, there is much more it can do. Can I reserve those comments for a little later? Thank you, Bill. Arnold. Yes, I, I certainly think the church is very relevant in our situation. It's the only um, community that I know of where, which transcends race, color, culture, uh, it's the only place where we can meet as people in the eyes of God. And I think it's very relevant. Bernard. Well, it remains relevant in the measure that it fulfills the mandate and message of the head of the church, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I see it, the moment it thinks that its main thrust is to be an ethical pressure group to keep people on the straight and narrow, as you put it, Bill, uh, it's missing the target, because the target is the gospel, the message of man's need as a, a sinful fallen creature to receive a new nature and to put faith in, in God. And this is the, the, the job of the church. And while we fulfill that job, it'll last. It won't be a fossil. Uh, you use that word. Uh, it's, a, it's the anvil, rather, that wears out lots of hammers. Bonaventure. Well, it seems to me that um, Jesus, when he came to save us human beings from the mucky situation we got ourselves into and continue to get ourselves into, uh, did this by leaving us three principal ways out of the mess. The first is the truth, because he himself said that the truth will set you free. Uh, the second was to share in his own divine life uh, as sons of God united to the Son of God. And the third was to live the life of love because this is what human life is all about, precisely because it's what God's life is all about. And these three things, it seems to me, are admirably uh, contained and fulfilled and have come down to us in the community which Jesus founded. Because there we have the truth handed down from generation to generation, we have the share of the divine life communicated to us through the sacraments, and we have a community which exists in Jesus' name in which love between members can function. So if this is the means towards our freedom and our liberation to which Jesus has given us, then it seems to me the church admirably fulfills this function. Bill, do you find the church as all-sufficient as Bonaventure seems to suggest? No. Uh, may I say that I ran a Gallup poll today. <clears throat> I went along to a business centre and there questioned a number of people and got some statistics. The statistics were as follows. 42% uh, of the people said, yes, the church was relevant, although some of them were no longer attending. 25% said, absolutely no. And 32% said, maybe. A fraction of 1% said, I haven't thought of it. Now, those statistics may be uh, fairly superficial, but there's one thing that stands out there, that the question is highly relevant. <clears throat> 
people do want to confront this issue. And the average opinion there was that they had left the church because it was sort of kid stuff. It was okay to start with, to go to Sunday school and to know that there is a God and that Jesus died for your sins and so forth. But how often do you have to hear that story? And furthermore, the church sits up there in its ivory tower. It should come down to the people. We're here with our problems. We want to be able to talk to those priests in real terms. And other opinions, uh, I may say, going from the atheistic viewpoint all the way through to theistic, uh, polytheistic, and so forth. I spoke to, spoke to one Muslim, a Jew, an atheist, and the rest were Christian. And so, from their point of view, those are the statistics, but they're vitally interested. But the church does not seem to be answering the questions they're asking. And I would like to put to you some of the questions you're not answering. And they are this. A. What is sin? B. Who and what is Christ? 3. What is God? And furthermore, who and what is Satan? Well, These... we're certainly answering those questions in our church, believe you me. And I'd like to come down from the ivory towers and from the coward's castle, the pulpit, and get down amongst you chaps and just tell you we preach about sin and about God and about his love. But I found out, particularly in the years I was in what's called Zimbabwe, that most people are unchurched because they were fed up with the institutional church. And we do make a difference between the institutional church, the church in the West, which is largely in the state of apostasy, emphasizing the social gospel, trying to put pressure on governments, and in one way or another, a facade because they have departed, many of them, from the Christian fundamentals. I don't know if you'll agree with me, Bill. Many church people, church teachers, have departed from the fundamentals, the God-given fundamentals of the Christian faith. You know, Bernard, I, I rather think that what you call the fundamentals, Bill might um, call kid stuff. No, <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> right or wrong, Bill? <laughs> well, shall I differentiate there, please? I think the church has done a fantastic job, more so than any other organization, to make people aware of the emotional relevance of God and the emotional requirement, that is, his physiological basic requirements. Hence the emphasis in the Christian church on the physiology of Jesus. And even hematology comes into the blood of the cross. So also the eating of flesh, which he called for, and also the drinking of blood. But there is another view to that which I'd like to present. What are you referring to there, actually, Bill? Uh, Jesus said, eat my body. And in the church, they do this in terms of the sacraments. Jesus said, I am the door. We don't take these phrases literally. Uh, we, we, t we use metaphorical language, surely. Fine, and I understand why. Because the man in the street, that is the homo sap of today, has come a long way and he's still highly emotional and you have to do it in terms of emotion. You have to do it in ter anthropomorphic terms. But there are other factors which are going to knock on your door very soon and I hope just now to be able to bring those in very strongly. All right, Bill, I, I take you to be saying that the church concentrates on the emotional development of man, but that there is another level to man's psyche, or call it what you will, which now needs to be developed. Arnold, right. how do you react to that? Well, I'm just a little lost at the moment. I haven't heard this kind of terminology. Um, it seems to me that kind of terminology is right out of touch. I'd like to know how many people looking at this program, mm -hmm. you know, understand that kind of language, because I don't understand it, you know. Uh, well, so perhaps we better talk a bit more on this. Well, I think that was it in very basic terms. The church um, caters for man's emotional well-being, but there is a new level of spirituality. I think that's what Bill was suggesting, which the church doesn't look after. On a venture. Uh, I wonder if Bill would sort of tell us where he's trying to get to. All right. Because it seems to me that up until now, we've sort of been hedging a little bit. Okay. Uh, and if we right. know where he's trying to get to, then we've got something to talk about. <laughs> okay. Straight from the shoulder, then, Bill. It is like but, this. Uh, quite There's quickly, first please. Adam, first man. And there is second Adam, second man. Christ represented second man. And that second man is the ultimate potential of all people today. The church's appeal is to, I would say, a thousand million, that is a quarter of mankind. That is a jolly good job of promotion, I would say. But the advent, we time, as being in the next four years, that is, uh, you will be seeing the countdown to this fantastic change referred to in Revelation and in the Bible. Now, second man, uh, uh, Christ... Could I like ask you there, the change to what? Change to the new enlightened man, who does not worship God, but works with God. But surely this has been, at least from a Catholic point of view, uh, the position of Christianity from the very beginning. Well, yeah. 
that, I mean, you know, we believe that God shares his life with us, what is in traditional theological language being known as grace, and that it is up to man to cooperate with this share of God's life which he gets, uh, what the Bible calls, if you like, the seed, divine seed that is planted in us, and that by cooperating with this, a person is enabled to become slowly more and more Christ-like, uh, and the people who succeed in eventually becoming very Christ-like, we end up calling saints because they're people who've made the grade. So, I mean, to say that people will begin to cooperate with God rather than worship Him, I think is sort of ignoring a 2,000 years of tradition where we believe this has been taking place. And I don't see why one has to pose cooperation as against worship because um, the two things, I think, can very happily coexist. Uh, may I put it like this? Mankind, or man, is a prosthetic being. That a is, he can being? A prosthetic. In, in plain, simple language, Bill, what's that? He mean? adds, he can add to himself. He can add to his raw, natural... So the being. evolution of man is not complete. Uh, quite. And his earlier development, his body, physical and emotional development, is more or less coming to an end now. We can't add any more emotions. We have developed every conceivable emotion in man. But there is something else which now has to develop. But you talk about development, can't you see that man has deteriorated? Oh no, man has not deteriorated, he's a fantastic well, the world's being. Well, in, in a mess. <laughs> I think personally that anybody who criticizes man, criticizes God. Well, how do you account for the fact that the world does seem so obviously in a mess? The world is not more of a mess than it has been. What it's going to do now is it has to answer, is there a God or is there not a God? As, as we sit here now, people can claim to be atheistic, and they can claim to be anything. But I think those options are going to run out with the advent, that is, towards the turn of the century, when the Holocaust, which we forecast uh, prophetically, is going to determine uh, where they stand. Well, we as also you know. believe in a Holocaust, Mr. Chairman. What kind I, do you believe in, Bernard? Well, I believe in the consummation of this age with the re personal return of Jesus Christ to this world. Yes. Is that what you believe in? Uh, not a personal return, because if you have to have an anthropomorphic figure, fair enough. We, for, in fact, have no fault to find whatsoever with any church or any man or any philosophy. In fact, we consider it all makes a pretty complete universe for God. Uh, we do not differentiate strongly between good and evil. We consider that everything works towards good. That well, is how I, we see it. Well, we, don't we make a difference between good and evil to start with? And we believe that the church's survival depends on it remaining distinctive from the world. In fact, one missionary came back from America the other day and he said, there's so much church in the world, your sort of worldly religion, and so much world in the church that you can't tell one from t'other. And I believe the church as a distinctive body, the people of God on earth, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, he's the head, is the most important thing that's happening today in the world, the church. Uh, Arnold, could I ask if you have any sympathy for this idea of the... The church now widening out, as it were, and becoming part of a great whole, and all paths leading to the same direction, and a kind of new universalism, perhaps. No, I, I can't. I can't go along with this. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't really understand it, uh, Bill. If we keep talking, perhaps there'll be more communication. But uh, well, the words <coughs> that are used. Uh, have you been a student of metaphysics? May I ask you that, Bill? In my close on 60 years, I've done just about everything, mm. and uh, until I had my own personal revelation as to what and who God is and so on. And uh, I came to this vital conclusion that nothing in the universe is wrong. Everything is right. There is a place for everything. But for man, there is maturation. There is understanding. This is the Christ. That Christ is that ultimate state of man. By maturation, you mean maturing, do you? Mature. Mature from his first state, Adam, first mm. man to second man, which completes his development. And he there then becomes a responsible being. He's not a responsible being now. The average person blames his church, blames his government, blames the weather, blames God. In fact, the one lady there said she wished she'd never been born. But surely the whole of Christianity <coughs> rests on the belief that man is responsible. Christianity as we've known it. Wouldn't you say so, Bonaventure? Yes, uh, surely, absolutely, because you can, there can be no question at all of sin and repentance and forgiveness and cooperation with God unless people are responsible. And I would like to uh, suggest this to you, that uh, I think as the scriptures show very clearly, particularly St. Paul, that the 
second Adam is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that we as other human beings move from the situation of the first Adam, if you like to call him that, the Adam who is somewhat estranged from God, though God is all the time seeking him and trying to call him back. Uh, we move from that position to sharing in the second Adam position of Jesus Christ precisely by being united to him through baptism and sharing in his life. That there is no question of me as an individual by my own powers at all achieving a Christ-likeness, but that I can receive from Christ the ability to correspond and to grow into him so that I become like him. And I think that this is very important because it sounds a little to me as though uh, the sort of ideas you're running are a type of self-salvation thing. Uh, no, <coughs> pardon me, naturally not. I did not create the universe, nor did any one single person. There can be no such thing as self-salvation. Uh, what I am saying may not be in the vocabulary of your own language, but there is another language. You know, many words do not use up language. And so I'd like to point out, too, that uh, in biblical rep representation, there, as the Chinese sometimes say, many words written could include error. But let us sidestep that for a moment. And I'd like to say this before the time runs out, that the Christ person that we postulate is the one that will take total responsibility for God and act responsibly, that that Christ person, the Christed person that Jesus uh, offered. It is all there. Uh, we haven't got time. This is metaphysical. No, really. not, this is biblical. And I wish I no. had time to quote it. But I would say this, and I'm going to give it to you now, that the time to come is going to see a large percentage of people, those that survive, their options having run out. And they are going to see that God is, in fact, boss. And one should cooperate with that. They're not doing that right now. And this is going to be the result psychosomatic diseases that you still have to cure people of will cease to arise. Accidents will not be accidents anymore. That's point number two. And mankind will be working in the direction of the common purpose of God and not fighting each other, but working with each other for the purpose of God. It's only the redeemed man that's in that picture, because you're really describing the millennium, where the lamb will lie down with a lion to use uh, yes. Metaphor. Yes, but metaphor. I would prefer to speak in modern scientific terms. This is what the people in this business center wanted. They want to know, what have you got to say to me? I would ask also that the church do the following. I'm a small man representing a very, representing a very small Well, I, I don't think you've really ma made it clear what you think is wrong with the type of belief that uh, brethren here well, Can I have. ask a question Nothing yeah. wrong. Mm. Everything is right. But you think right. it's immature. You're talking about something that you regard as more mature. More mature. But you, I don't think you've really made it quite clear what this new thing is, and that's what we really want to get our teeth into. But uh, could you do it very briefly, exactly. succinctly? What is this new thing right. that you're driving at? The first man worships what he does not understand. Mm -hmm. The second man understands, therefore does not worship. That's putting it in a nutshell. So the, the, new man, the new man is a creature of intellect, you're saying, whereas yes. the, the old man is a creature of emotion. And right. we've got to graduate from emotion to intellect. Right. Now, salvation as you understand it, Bernard, is that a thing of the heart can I ask, or of the mind? Can I ask our friend a question? Yes. Um, would you consider me irresponsible for be distinguish distinguishing between good and evil? I'm going to ask you a question. Do you sin? I do. Then you are irresponsible, sir. But am I irresponsible but for thinking that there's a difference between good and evil? That's my question. All people should be able to differentiate between subjects of the choice. But do you choice. differentiate between good and evil? I differentiate between any two things that can be differentiated. You said he was <laughs> irresponsible because he sins, but surely the very word sin <laughs> implies responsibility. No. <laughs> uh, sin, <laughs> sin mm. is an action, and I can mm. tell you, I can tell you in very precise terms what sin a man performs. I can do it. I did not do it here as a magical trick. Gosh, I will so tell you this. Sin is that's the transgression of the law. That's what the Bible is. I would like mm. to define sin for you mm. as we see it. Sin is any thought, feeling, or action which the person initiates, which he does not take responsibility for. And well, this, of course, is not a Christian definition. Therefore, no. we're talking at cross purposes for in the first place mm. because okay, sure. precisely a Christian understanding of sin is something for which I do, in point of fact, take responsibility. Right. Uh, I would say that. <coughs> far more sin is in its deepest uh, reality two facets of one and the same thing. 
The one is self-centeredness, an excessive preoccupation with myself, rather than going out towards God and other people and other things. And secondly, it is also a despair that, of the fact that God is all-sufficient for me. And so I try and do a little petty thieving on the sidelines uh, because I don't think that God is, in point of fact, sufficient for all my needs as a person. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the essence of sin. Getting back, if I may, to the relevance of the church from which we started, mm. I've got an idea that Bill may represent a group of people who look at the church and see it as a rather stuffy sort of thing with no great evidence of life it about it. It really isn't. It's dynamic and it's transforming lives. But why don't the people outside always see that quality in us? Because they don't come inside. It's no. rather like looking at a stained glass window. If you look at a stained glass window from outside, it's dark and ugly. But you go inside the church and see the sun shining through the glorious colours of the, of the stained glass window. Well, and I'm asking Bill if you'll come inside and join us. Well, couldn't one <laughs> just as well ask the question about Jesus? After all, uh, there could probably, well, I believe there was no more dynamic person on this earth than Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. And yet only a small minority ended up going with him. Well, he said many go down the broad yeah. road. The vast majority, even those who got as far as coming inside Bernard's um, building to look at the stained glass windows yes. and listen to him, <coughs> still didn't follow him. That would be all very well if we, if we were like Jesus Christ, but are we sure that we are? No, no, I'm not saying that, mm -hmm. but I'm saying, you know, one is up against a human factor here. But mm. we're intended to be like that him. And even yes, but to what extent are we? If people even didn't uh, respond to Jesus Christ, uh, how much less can we expect a total response of everybody to uh, an institution which is very human? Mm. May I answer that question? Jesus Christ was a prototype. He came in his right time, as everything occurs timelessly in God's universe. It is not higgledy-piggledy or scrambled, as people Correct. think. Correct. There are seasons for things, yeah. and Jesus Christ occurred precisely when he ought to have. Correct. That was a prototypical situation. Mm -hmm. And the starter, the church has represented the preparation of man for the advent, 2,000 years. And you have done what you have done. You seem to think that you ready. know pretty precisely when the Advent is coming. Yes. Uh, well, 2,000 years is a very, very short time. You mean, uh, all that Jesus Christ came to do and uh, all the work that has gone on for the last 2,000 years is only for the short period, really. It, it seems to me, you know, that uh, the fact that everything is about to wind up or blow up, I don't know which way you see it, uh, is a viewpoint which is very difficult to find any substance. It's one which no. a lot of people hold these days. Yes. Yes, but they, I mean, they've, they've held it at regular periods ever since uh, Jesus Christ <coughs> came. Yes. You, we had a First World War. It occurred. It was a reality. Mm. There was a Second World War. But that wasn't a blow to Christianity. But that there's going to be a Third life. World War. Correct. This one is not going to be pea shooters and fire sticks. It is going to be an atomic world war, and one had better take it seriously. Now, why is it necessary? God does not say, have a war. He just says, if you don't sort these things out, if you don't have a tremendous sociological readjustment, I'm going to have to help you, hurt you, burn you. And in that process, you will learn to respect who is the maker. I must say, I can't yeah. worship that sort of a god. Mm. because I don't believe that God hurts and burns. I believe that God has given us responsibility for this world in which he has placed us, and that if we, by being irresponsible, hurt and burn ourselves, it's our fault. It is not yeah. God hurting and burning us. Quite right. I'd like okay. to add to that, that God does not punish us for our sins. We are punished by our sins. Mm. Exactly. Can I come uh, in here? Uh, do I understand that you don't believe that we have the fullness of revelation in Holy Scripture, that you've had a new revelation? Uh, I am not a believer. I am a knower. Christ represents the spirit of understanding, spirit of truth. He said, when I go, I will ask my the Father Holy spirit. to send you another counsellor. And that counsellor will be the spirit of truth indeed. I do not believe that. I know that. It is the spirit of truth, mm. and I can define truth for you. I can define the things that I've said the church cannot, be, cannot define. Well, the church says that Christ is the truth. Yes. The truth was incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, I would um, like to just uh, take you up on that for a moment, Phil. Uh, you might remember that St. Paul, uh, particularly in the 13th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians, points out that knowledge and understanding and, wi standing and wisdom and all these things are not ultimately what Christianity is all about. 
that Christianity is about love and that knowledge and wisdom and understanding are only functions of the love which Christians should exercise. Yes, <coughs> Therefore, for you to see um, that moving from belief to a level of knowledge is to reach the pinnacle seems to me not to be in conformity with uh, either the gospel of Jesus Christ or the teachings of St. Paul, where love is the supreme achievement mm -hmm. uh, in the power that God gives us to love with. Well, has the church possessed the secret of life for 2,000 years already, or is there a new lesson which she needs to learn and needs to learn quick? Over to you. Good night. Mm -hmm.